My lab is uh, deeply interested in finding uh, creative solutions to solve the antibiotic crisis. So uh, there's, a, there's a significant uh, problem, as many people know, that there's, uh, there's an increase in resistance to antibiotics by a number of, uh, of bacteria that cause disease. Um, and uh, we're trying to find ways to contribute to solve this problem. Um, we use a variety of, of techniques here at McMaster to do that, and our, but our goal at the end of the day is to understand as much as we can about the problem and to use that information to try and help solve the problem. One of the great things about McMaster actually, and um, it's, it's, it's sort of a Goldilocks phenomenon, it's exactly the right size um, with the right mix of people to be able to, to, to tackle problems using multiple uh, approaches. So we are big enough in that we have you know, a large medical school, we have um, you know, outstanding infrastructure, we're able to compete at an international level for, for funding. Um, we have a great critical mass of people working together. But we're also small enough in that we really know each other well. Um, I interact well with the folks in math, in pathology, in medicine, in chemistry. I know people around campus. It's, it's easy to find people, it's easy to get people to work together, uh, which I think is really unique about this place. You know, it's, I th as I said, I think it's, it's just right to be able to bring all of these people together, all of these techniques together, uh, and compete at an international level um, in, this, in this area. A world without antibiotics looks like it did um, at the turn of the 20th century. So the first antibiotics that were discovered were the sulfa drugs in the 1930s, and that really changed the world. And then penicillin during the Second World War, uh, followed by streptomycin, which was the first drug ever to be used for tuberculosis. Um, and then all of the, the drugs that we use now were discovered actually very shortly thereafter, in the last 20 years or so after that. And uh, that, of course, changed the way we do everything. So few of us can remember what it was like before uh, the 1940s um, when tuberculosis was the major source of, uh, of respiratory disease in, in the world. Um, there were sanatoriums and, and, and uh, caused a lot of, of disease and a lot of death. Um, that's, tuberculosis, for all intents and purposes, is gone in, in North America and Europe. Um, we can do things now that you couldn't even dream of back then. We can do open heart surgery. You can take premature infants and keep them alive and, and they grow up to be uh, remarkable adults. We um, can do, we can treat cancer. Uh, which we never could before. And the way we do it is we give them such powerful drugs that wipe out their immune system and make them make people incredibly susceptible to infection. But we can treat that infection with, with antibiotics. The lack of, why is it that new, we don't have any new antibiotics? What's, what's happened? Well, there's a lot, of, a lot of theories and a lot of interesting ideas about this. One, one of the reasons is that most of the antibiotics that we have uh, in, the, in the clinic today actually come from other bacteria. They come from the bacteria that live in the soil. So that, that earthy smell when you dig up, dig up um, you know, dirt in your backyard, that smell comes from the bacteria that, uh, that live in, in the soil. And those bacteria turn out to be the, the absolute perfect sources of drugs. And so that's what the pharmaceutical industry mined from the 1940s to the 1970s, looking for new drugs. And um, that's what was incredibly successful. What happened after that though, is that they kept discovering the same ones. So they kept discovering you know, tetracycline again and streptomycin again, and that became very frustrating for the, for the pharmaceutical industry and, and, and very challenging to deal with. And at the same time that that happened, um, the, there's a paradigm shift in, in the pharmaceutical industry in that 
robots and um, large libraries of chemicals became very fashionable. We call this combinatorial chemistry was the way that it was approached. And so everyone thought that's where we're going to find our new antibiotics. We're just going to, we're going to do this in very large scales using these libraries of chemicals that we made in the lab. And it turned out 20 years later that we haven't been able to, to discover one antibiotic out of that, those, or using those methods. That really the, the best place that we, we, we were finding them were, was back with these environment, environmental organisms in the dirt. And so we have a situation now where, where those, it's getting, it has become increasingly difficult to find new, new antibiotics using all the methods that we've done in the past. And on top of that, of course, the, the economics of antibiotics has been challenging as well for the pharmaceutical industry, right? So a course of, of antibiotics now, these days, because most of them are off patent, is dollars, $10, $20. Um, Whereas the cost of a brand new drug would be much, much more. And it's been challenging to get people to pay for, for that amount of, uh, for that, that kind of money, to pay for new antibiotics. Which is odd because they're going to save your life. You'd think it'd be worth it. But, um, and then on top of that, we've had challenges with the regulatory industry. We've been, you know, it's important that the government puts very strict controls over new drugs coming to market. You know, we cannot have drugs that are, that are unsafe. And that means very large clinical trials. And those very large clinical trials are very expensive. And those, those trials, therefore, um, add to the, to, the, to the burden of bringing new drugs to market. They keep us safe, but they're also very expensive. And as I said before, it's hard to get people to pay the real cost of an antibiotic. And so all of these things together, really hard science, challenging economic models, and, and and extensive regulation has created essentially a perfect storm where it's made it very difficult to get new antibiotics. And that's the situation that we're in right now. Many years ago in, in my lab, we, uh, we made a conscious decision to go back to the old model of trying to find antibiotics. And that is to go back to the soil. And to make and to collect organisms that live in the soil, bacteria and fungi, um, and just begin to screen them again for um, molecules that might be helpful to solve this uh, this resistance problem. And so, as a result, what I did is I, I I encouraged all of my students and all the people who were associated with the lab that whenever they're on vacation or whenever they're on um, they're out on a hike somewhere with their, with their significant others or they're out bicycling, just to bring, on, bring along with them a little sandwich bag and take a soil sample, um, if they can, as long as it's legal. <laughs> and, uh, and so one of my students was, was in a national park in, in Nova Scotia, camping and hiking. And she remembered this and she just walked off the trail and, and under a pine tree, collected a small sample of soil in a sandwich bag and brought it back to the lab. And it became part of the collection. We have hundreds of these samples from mostly from around Canada. And, um, and what we've been doing is systematically going through them and collecting the organisms that live, in, live inside them. And, uh, and one of those organisms um, turned up in this screen that we, we, that we ran to try and find a molecule that can block this uh, this really surprisingly um, difficult to deal with uh, antibiotic resistance protein that, that emerged um, from India about five years ago and has spread around the world and is really causing tremendous amount of difficulty uh, in the treatment of infectious disease. And so by what we did in that case is we interrogated our collection, all of this collection that we've been, we've been picking up from, of, of these bacterial strains and fungal strains from around the environments of Canada, to see, does any of them producing something that will block the activity of this new resistance protein? And sure enough, the sample that my student collected, you know, half a decade ago in, while hiking in Nova Scotia, turned up to be the one that, that worked.
I've been interested in in killing microbes for a long time. Uh, my my doctoral work in, was in chemistry that I did at the University of Waterloo, and there we were looking at molecules that could block the the um, the activity of fungi, fungal pathogens. So there are s certain kinds of fungi that well, are actually quite difficult to, to treat. Um, and at that time, it was at the very height of the, of the AIDS crisis. And uh, fungal pathogens were very, very challenging to deal with and, and, and a really significant part of, of what we were all living through at that time, which was just a, a remarkable uh, time in infectious disease. And after that, I had the opportunity to go do a postdoctoral work in, uh, in the Boston area. And there I got involved with a group that were dealing with the emergence of, a, of this brand new resistance to a, a mechanism to an antibiotic called vancomycin. And the team that, that worked with that were, was chemists, uh, biochemists, and clinicians who were all working together to try and, and solve this sort of this mystery that had appeared in the clinic um, in Boston and has since spread around the world. Um, and that, I found that environment to be so stimulating and so exciting to be, to be working on, you know, an organism that was evolving before our eyes, essentially, um, and that had direct clinical implications. Um, that when I came time to, to look for a, a position of my own, um, I just thought that I needed to be in an environment that could help support that kind of science, that, that, that mixture between the clinic uh, and the lab, and to be working on things that really matter to, to the health of, of Canadians. And so that's when I came to McMaster uh, a million years ago. <laughs> uh, no, 1993 is when I came, 21 years ago. And, uh, and over time, we've been able to build exactly that, that program that I, had, uh, I, I got so excited about, which was to, to bring people together with different backgrounds to help solve problems in infectious disease. And, and antibiotic resistance is, is probably the most pressing clinical um, problem in infectious disease um, that we have right now. And so it's exciting. Well, I see, so there's, the, the science that comes out of my lab has, has a, lot of, a lot of implications, I think, or impact, I hope. One, the, the first of which is just expanding knowledge. I mean, what, we're, what we do is, is we're finding out things that no one has ever found out before. And that's the reason, you know, that I became a scientist in the first place. Uh, there's no more continents to discover. Uh, and so if you're really interested in, 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 in exploration, then science is no better, er, there's no better place than science to be able to do it. I mean, we're, we're, just, we're seeing things that no one else has, has seen before. So we're opening up knowledge. So that's one way that we're having an impact. The other thing that, that the, the lab is doing is training just an amazing group of young people um, that are gonna go out and start their own labs, or they're gonna become physicians, or they're gonna become government workers or lawyers or um, any manner of, of highly productive citizen um, you know, that have been inspired and, and, and been immersed in an environment that, is, that brings multiple uh, techniques together, multiple ways of solving problems. And those, those strategies, whether you're still working in science or you're building a bridge or you're trying to um, you know, maintain your house, are really important and I'm really excited about that and I've been just blessed by having just a, r a remarkable group of people. And then ultimately the, the, you know, the other impact could actually be that we could discover something that might end up um, either inspiring uh, the drug discovery field or actually being part of it. And I've been very lucky to work with um, members of the pharmaceutical industry for a number of years to try and take um, inventions that we found in the lab uh, further to see if we can solve some of these problems and um, and our hope is that the kind of science that we're doing uh, in the lab here at Mac will um, will actually have a direct impact on people's health.